this to uh, this event. Um, I'm constantly looking at Twitter, very excited to see it. And so um, really genuinely interested and excited to hear Lasana Hotep, who I've heard you speak in other venues. And so I can't quite believe our luck at having you uh, as part of our very amazing series of events. Thank you to Dr. Lopez. Thank you to Armia Walker also for, and everyone for all of your work on just an amazing lineup of events in this really important month. So with that, again, thank you. And I appreciate the opportunity to be here and to say welcome. Thank you so much. I also noticed that our student trustee, David Ramirez is here. Thank you so much, David, for um, tuning in and supporting us. And uh, to get started, I wanted to spotlight one of our students who has in, an incredible talent and gift and uh, will be um, sharing a video of her singing the Black National Anthem. This is Kamari Sturdevant, one of our Ujima students. Lift every voice and sing Till earth and heaven ring Ring with the harmonies of liberty Let our rejoicing rise High as the listening skies Let it resound loud as the rolling sea Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us Facing the rising sun of our new day begun let us march on till victory is won. It was incredible. Thank you so much to Kamari for sharing your gifts and talents with us. And uh, I was exchanging text messages with her uh, last night and she was just very excited to be able to share this with you. I also noticed that one of our trustees for Linda Brown is here with us. Thank you so much trustee Brown for supporting us. And without further ado, um, the reason why we've gathered is because we have an incredible um, speaker with us. Uh, Mr. Lasana Hotep is an anti-racist and anti-sexist educator He's a strategic thought partner and equity advancing executive coach with a commitment to dismantling institutional inequities and creating transformative solutions for people and organizations. He's the founder and lead consultant of Hotep Consultants. He leverages his culturally sustaining historical analysis with practices rooted in racial justice to address issues of equity within the workplace. Lasana currently serves as the Director of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging at the University of California, Berkeley. In addition to these roles, he is a writer, highly sought after lecturer, and established educational professional and co-author of a new book called Minding the Obligation Gap striving for equity in community colleges and beyond. And I want everyone to know that Lasana has worked at community colleges in both Arizona and here in California at Skyline College. He is amazing and um, you know is currently doing consultant work at many of our community colleges across the state. And I'm very honored to be able to work with him at a few of those in doing that kinds of consulting work. I learned so much from Lasana, and I'm really just proud and honored to introduce uh, not only a colleague, but someone I consider a co-conspirator and friend. Um, Lasana, thank you for being here. 
Thank you very much, Dr. Olivo. I'm honored uh, at, uh, at Pasadena City College extending the invitation. Uh, I want to uh, give a debt of gratitude to uh, President and Superintendent uh, Dr. Erica Indriones, um, also Dr. Lopez and all the commitment work to the Umoja community. Thank you very much, Kamari, for blessing us with uh, the Black National Anthem to start it out. And uh, also want to extend a, a gratitude and appreciation to Trustee Brown. So I'm glad that everyone has come and assembled uh, as a part of this collective of experiences to acknowledge Black History Month uh, and to engage in an opportunity to uh, broaden our understandings and our perspectives when it comes to uh, people of African ancestry and our sojourn. And so we're here because it's February and February is Black History Month. And uh, for as long as I've been around, I've noticed that around this time, uh, a variety of different uh, happenings begin to surface because of Black History Month. One of the most constant things is, why do we have to have Black History Month? And this comes from all quarters. It comes from the quarters of people who feel as if there is um, unfair or inequitable or an act of inequality to have a month dedicated uh, to a particular cultural community within the United States of America. Uh, there's other people who are African-American who pose questions like, why did they give us the shortest, coldest month, right? And so there's a whole broad spectrum on how people take on Black History Month. So that's why the title of this presentation is borrowed from the great leaders of the Black Lives Matter movement to Black History Matters. Right. We're going to talk about why Black History matters and why Black History Month not only matters, why it exists, and why it's imperative that it continues to exist in perpetuity. Because like I said, it's Black History Month. And so I don't care who you are, Black History Month always sets something off. Some of you may be familiar with this story, right? The Utah school made Black History Month optional, right? Then they reversed it. You know, when I first saw this headline, a friend of mine sent it to me and texted to me and I, my reply was, the thing about it is the Black History Month has always been optional. <laughs> That's not nothing new. <laughs> That's just a continuation of the pattern. You know, Barnes and Noble found themselves in the Black History Month controversy, right? Their, their controversy stemmed around them releasing classical texts by white authors but putting black characters on the covers of the books. So they wanted to pay homage to black history uh, by putting black characters uh, or black depictions uh, on books that weren't written by black people. And then the black writer named Eric Jerome Dickey, he was like, why don't you just put black novels on display and just sell black books? But you know, Barnes and Noble's not alone. For years we've had this, we had a teacher in the Bronx who found herself in a battle, who had been accused of banning Black History Month at her particular institution, right? She had told people not to put up Black History Month flyers and she instructed one particular um, teacher to not teach a Black History lesson. And then you have, you know, the political angle where a politician in South Dakota wrote a Black History Month resolution, but within the resolution, he claimed that the United States has a positive history of race and slavery. And then you have it coming to our quarters, our domain in education, where Black History Month program at Brigham Young University was Zoom bombed uh, while uh, they were having a question and answer. The types of questions that were posed were what is the percentage of African-Americans on food stamps? And why do African-Americans hate the police? And why don't we have any white people on the stage? This is Black History Month. Every February, you can count on this. This year in New Jersey, universities reported attacks, virtual attacks during the Black History Month celebrations. And they 
use slurs and they used all type of racial epithets and put uh, pictures on the screen of uh, black people uh, being mutilated. This is Black History Month. How does something that you would think as benign as acknowledging the history of people that are part of our community would generate such vitriol, generate a consistent reactionary and adversarial dehumanizing response, right? This whole, what is Black History Month? And why do we have Black History Month? And what it creates in all the different types of responses that we're seeing around this phenomenon, right? And so when we talk about Black History Month, for us to even understand what it is and why it is, we have to understand the context under which Black History Month was created. Black History Month started out as a week in 1926, which we'll talk about uh, later. But the person who developed Black History Month, the founder of Black History Month, lived in an America that had a certain socialized context. And this is one of the biggest challenges that we face. What is the context under which things are happening? Not that things are happening, but what is the context? So what was the context that Dr. Carter Godwin Woodson, better known as Carter G. Woodson, was living in that led him to say, you know what? We need to do something specifically to acknowledge Black life on the planet Earth. Well, what was that? What was going on? Well, maybe this had an influence, right? In 1906, a man named Ota Banga was brought from the Congo, from the, from the Mubuti people, and he was brought to the United States of America from the Congo initially to be a part of an anthropological exhibit in 1904. And then after they brought him to the anthropological exhibit, they put this man into the zoo in Bronx. Right? A black man as a type of an ape. That's why you see him on the cover of this book about his life holding a chimpanzee because he was a part of the exhibit on apes. And eventually African-American clergy, James Gordon, you know, lobbied to get him freed. And eventually he moved to Virginia where he ultimately ended up committing suicide because of just his disenchantment of not having family, not having community and being exploited. Maybe Carter G. Woodson was familiar with Oda Vanga. I'm pretty sure. I know Carter G. Woodson, the founder of Black History Month, was familiar that after the enslavement of African people in the post antebellum period, there was this strong uh, push to continue to maintain Black people in their quote unquote place and to dehumanize Black people, which led to phenomena such as minstrel shows where people, mostly white, some Black, would put dark makeup or dark cork on their faces, put red lipstick on, put on wigs, and make characteriz uh, characterizations of Black people of being lazy and, and shiftless and, and docile and dumb. And this was the largest form of entertainment in the United States of America at the turn of the century. Maybe Carter G. Woodson was moved to create Black History Month because in 1915, they re released a film called The Birth of a Nation based off of a book by Thomas Dixon called The Klansman. And in Birth of a Nation, the plot is Black people are freed from enslavement. They begin to take office in state and federal government. And when they take office, they do two things. They eat fried chicken on the floor of Congress and they rape white women. And in raping white women and eating fried chicken, this has to come to an end. And America is looking for someone to end this. And the heroes of the birth of a nation or the organization known as the Ku Klux Klan. This film, The Birth of a Nation, if you go to any film school or if you study film or cinema, is considered the quintessential foundational film in American cinema. It is the first film ever screened in the White House and President Woodrow Wilson at the time said it's like writing history 
with lightning. Maybe Carter G. Woodson was paying attention to what was going on around him and that black people were indiscriminately being picked up off of roads and streets, whether in urban areas or rural areas, whether in the North or the South in the United States of America and being burnt at the stake and being shot and being dismembered and being hung from trees and lamp posts. And while all of this is taking place, the people who participated in these spectacles of dehumanization went home that night, had dinner with their families, went off to work the next day. There was no accountability. So maybe Carter G. Woodson was paying attention to these phenomena. Maybe he was looking at these things and saying, something needs to be done. And me as an intellectual, maybe there's something I can do about it. But the interesting thing is that I show you these historical pieces and people say, well, Asana, that was a long time ago. Right? Why do we need Black History Month now? Well, how is it that on TikTok, some young people know if they want to make fun of Black people, still to this day, they know to put dark makeup on their face. And in this case, the young lady was trying to make fun of Black women. So she stuffed things into her pants, right? How do people know? Is there a workshop? Is there a, 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 some type of summit that people, how to insult Black people? Because this started at the end of enslavement post-1865, and even now, right here in 2020, 2021, people know these types of things. So the Black face has not gone away. Well, people say, well, Asana, the Ku Klux Klan and, and the birth of a nation, that was 1915. Well, we have right now that we're on a 20-year rise of white supremacist hate groups in the United States of America. Why does Black history matter? Well, back to the notion of the lynching. People aren't taking the streets because of the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and, and Trayvon Martin and Tamir Rice because just because they were killed by police and many of them are unarmed. In some cases, one of them was asleep in their bed. It's because the murderer, just like lynch mobs, will commit the crime, go home that night, have a meal with their family and go to work the next day just like what happened with Ahmaud Aubrey, just like George Zimmerman did with Trayvon Martin. Why do we have Black History Month, you would say? Well, even the monkey trope has not gone the way that we can trace back to Otabenga. This was a controversial ad by H&M. They had an African-American young man wearing a hoodie that said the coolest monkey in the jungle. This constant campaign of not just offending black people, people think it's about being offended, but dehumanizing on a consistent protracted basis. So maybe Carter Godwin Woodson, the founder of Black History Month was plainly aware of this African proverb. Until the lion learns to write, every story will glorify the hunter. Every story will glorify the hunter. And so driven by this understanding, being in this historical and social context, Dr. Carter Godwin Woodson got to work. Well, who is Carter G. Woodson? Who is this founder of Black History Month? Carter G. Woodson, also known as the father of Black history, was the son of former enslaved Africans. And he understood the importance of education, even though he didn't even begin his formal education until he was 20 years old. But he eventually finished his education in West Virginia, made his way to the University of Chicago, and ultimately in 1912, he became the second African-American to earn a PhD from Harvard University. And with that PhD, he went to work at Howard University. And at Howard University, he got into a conflict with the administration there about what was the purpose of education for black students. And so he became an independent educator and in becoming an independent, independent educator, Carter G. Woodson started an organization called the Association for the Study of Negro Life in History, which currently exists as the Association for the Study of African-American Life in History, or we call it ASALA. It was started in 1915. And in 1915, 
He started ASALA as an organization that primary responsibility was to send scholars out to research information about black life in America and all over the, the diaspora in an effort to chronicle, to synthesize and create a canon about black life, black lifestyles and black contributions to the globe. And that process of going throughout the year and then coming to present your findings about black life in this very hostile dehumanizing climate when they would come together as a sala, that would be during February, which became Negro History Week. So for people who are upset that Black History Month is in February, Black History Month is in February because Carter G. Woodson put it in February. And he put it in February in a particular week that he placed between the birthdays of Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln. In Black History Month, as we say, I'm Black every day, Black History Month is every day, or Black History Month is every month. Yes, we understand that argument as well. They didn't just study Black history during that time. That was just a time where they presented their findings. It went on for 50 years within segregated Black schools, within the organization of Asala, within informal and formal social and community organizations before it hit the radar of the federal government and was officially acknowledged in turn Black History Month in 1976. So this part should at least answer the question, why do we have Black History Month? Black History Month didn't come out of the ether. It came out of strategizing, it came out of organizing, and it came out of a social context of combating the, the dehumanizing narratives and treatment of people of African, uh, African heritage. We were to also study our contributions, but most importantly, Black History Month exists and Carter G. Woodson created it and Asala continues to promote it because of the lessons learned. This is the piece that's normally missing when we talk about Black History Month. What are the lessons learned? And that's what we're gonna talk a lot about during our time together. What are the lessons to be learned? Dr. Carter G. Woodson wrote several texts. Some of them are The Education of the Negro Prior to 1861. The other ones is African Folk Tales or African Myths. And his magnum opus, his most popular text is The Miseducation of the Negro. And the Miseducation of the Negro is the book that introduces Carter G. Woodson's arguments about why and how people of African ancestry should be educated and what has been the challenges of the ways in which black people of, uh, people of African descent have been educated in America. And this is one of the quotes for those who wanna know, why do we have a black history month? Dr. Carter G. Wilson says, if a race has no history, if it has no worthwhile tradition, it becomes a negl negligible factor in the thought of the world and it stands in danger of being exterminated. Yes, Carter G. Woodson saw how powerful history is. Another person that's responsible for popularizing Black history and African uh, heritage uh, in more contemporary times, Carter G. Woodson, I mean, uh, Dr. John Henry Clark puts the importance of Black history this way. History is a clock that people use to tell the political and cultural time of day. It is also a compass that people use to find themselves on the map of human geography. History tells of people where they have been and what they have been, where they are and what they are. Most important, history tells a people where they still must go what they still must be. The relationship of history to the people is the same as the relationship of a mother to her child. And so Dr. John Henry Clark makes it clear the value and the importance of history. Why does black history matter? Black, black history traditionally it serves a function of boosting cultural esteem of black people. That's normally how it's been used traditionally and also raising the awareness of black contributions to the broader communities that we're all connected to. 
right? That is traditionally how black history has been connected. And it's typically come through these types of lenses. Black first, the first black person to break the color line here, the first black person to break the color line there. Black entertainers, right? A lot of information about black people in the entertainment industry. Black athletes, black history normally focus on black people in athletics and especially black first in athletics, as you can see by the cover of the film of 42 about uh, Jackie Robinson, a Pasadena native. Uh, political figures are normally the highlight. And then sometimes we talk about food, right? We have events where we talk, about, we have soul food, we talk about dance and we talk about military contributions. That's typically how black history is covered. Black history normally has the same trio of folks. We, you know, you're gonna have a program, we're gonna talk about Frederick Douglass. We're gonna talk about the great Rosa Louise Parks. We're gonna talk about the iconic Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. When you bring it contemporary Black History Month, you're gonna see people talk about people like Michael Jordan and Oprah Winfrey. And of course, the first African-American president of the United States of, uh, of America, Barack Hussein Obama. But again, I want you to understand that the most important thing is not just highlighting these wonderful men and women who have contributed so greatly to the world and to America and to our communities in a variety of ways. But in order to get to the essence of why Carter G. Woodson created Black History Month, we have to understand Black history from this particular level. We have to understand our contributions to high culture. We're gonna talk about that. We have to tell the narratives of resistance. We have to tell the narratives of how we face insurmountable odds. We have to talk about the legacy of policy in Black life. We have to talk about the global impact of Black American culture. Then we, of course, have to always be connected to the broader diaspora that we are part of. And the most important thing, again, is what? The lessons learned. We have to focus on the lessons learned. What do I mean by, Lasana, why are you harping on lessons learned? Well, let's just take a little look. This is the cover of the first Black Panther newspaper published here, as you see highlighted, on April 25th, 1967. As you can see, this is issue number one, with the Black Panther Party of Self-Defense founded in Oakland, California. This is their first newspaper. And the, the topic of discussion on the front page is, why was Denzel Dowell murdered? because Denzel Dowell was murdered by the police. Well, if we do not learn the lessons of history, we will not understand why we have to have thousands of people of multiple backgrounds, from multiple walks of life, from multiple viewpoints, storm the streets because of the murder of someone like the, like the late, great George Floyd in Minneapolis, Minnesota. If we don't learn those lessons, the question of, why was Denzel Dowell killed in 1967? Was never thoroughly examined, was never thoroughly addressed. The conditions that produced the extrajudicial killing of him had never been addressed. So we're dealing with it right now. Black history matters. We have to learn the lessons. But it's hard to learn the lessons when you have just a very sketchy understanding of what black history actually is, right? We got this very sketchy timeline. It's like black people were in Africa doing who knows what. And then somehow we got enslaved and then Harriet Tubman came, right? And she freed some enslaved Africans. And then Martin Luther King Jr. was born. And what he did was he helped enslaved Africans get free too with Harriet Tubman. And then when he got done with that, he helped Barack Obama become president of the United States. And then after that, you know, chat with Bozeman blew us away with Marvel's Black Panther. That's kind of like the sketchy timeline that we have, right? We really don't know. The past is just the past. We, we were like, yeah, Ida B. Wells was with Harriet Tubman and Sojourner Truth was with Martin Luther King. It just, it's all just old Black news. And this, is, and this is not by accident, right? Because if you want to exploit people, if you want to marginalize people, you always keep certain things kind of murky, not too clear, right? You're very selective about the people that you highlight. You're very selective about the events that people are aware of because it's not about actually having an accurate historical record. It's about maintaining a narrative, right? 
Because if we were to look at a more historically accurate timeline, right? It would start, of course, on the continent of Africa where people of African ancestry did human first. That's the first thing we did. So that's the first contribution. If you wanna talk about Black History Month, the first black contribution, right? Due to no volition of our own, that's where humanity started in East Africa. That's what anth anthropology tells us. And yes, we had high culture. We had some of the oldest civilizations known to humanity, right? And what is now called Egypt, but at the time was called Kemet. And I'll address that argument if the Egyptians were black shortly. But not only did we have high culture in Egypt, we had West African kingdoms. During European dark ages, we had Mali, we had Ghana, we had Songhai. And as you can see here, a depiction of Mansa Musa, the king of Mali during the 1300s. But we of course had a low period where Africa was colonized and people of African ancestry were brought into the hemisphere to serve as slave labor. We call that the Ma'afa the great disaster. And then once we worked to end the great disaster, we went through another point we call the low point of the nadir of Jim Crow segregation, where we were terrorized for a hundred years after being enslaved. But a coalition of our ancestors and many men, women, and young people from multiple walks of life organized in the United States of America and participated in the civil rights movement slash black freedom movement. And out of that birth of a generation of people who created something called hip hop, which became a global phenomenon. And now in the contemporary period, we have the era of Black Lives Matter, as you can see represented here by Opal, Patrice and Alicia. And so this is more of a accurate timeline. This is a more of a, you don't have to know every single date. You don't have to know every single period, but understanding that our history, that our culture and our contributions are vast and not only vast, but has also laid foundation for all the other cultural months and all the other celebrations, right? It's very interesting how people of African ancestry tend to serve as somewhat the cannon fodder or the, the, the canary in the coal mine to a lot of things. And then once we've broken down the wall, then people start questioning, well, why do, why, why do we have this? And why do they have that? And why do they have this, right? Trying to act as if there was no context for all of the things that have taken place for us to need to have a Black History Month. So Black History Month isn't just about a celebration for cultural esteem, it's about learning the lessons. So what do I mean when I went through that whole process about how do we study Black History Month? I said, we have to understand Black high culture, right? And so this is me in 2019, in July 2019 in Egypt. And I went to Egypt with a, a group of uh, people who go annually. And uh, part of the trip that we go on uh, is you go to the Cairo Museum. When you go to the Cairo Museum, it's full of antiques and artifacts and things from antiquity, right? And then they have all of these various traditional museum uh, placards that explain phenomena, right? And so you go to this one area of the Cairo Museum, and there's this area talking about a guy named Maharpra. Maharpra. And this is actually on the wall. I took this picture with my phone. And it says this on the wall. At any rate, on the copy of the Book of the Dead found in the tomb and now exhibited on the walls of the room, where Harper is depicted with his face black instead of the normal red. A detailed examination of his mummy, which showed that he died at about 20 years of age, also showed that he was Negroid, but not actually Negro. I don't know what that means. <laughs> but I know what it's trying to communicate. He was black, but he wasn't black, black. <laughs> this is on the wall in the Cairo Museum right now as we sit here, right? And when you go through the Cairo Museum and you look at the headdress that some of the people in the monarchy used to wear, you come across something like this. I took this picture with my phone. This isn't something that I Googled. And this is the headdress in the Cairo Museum depicting the Egyptian people, right? Look at the hair, look at the braids, right? 
But people want to have a debate with people of African ancestry. Was an African civilization in Africa of African people? Because we have to deal with this. This is why we have to have a Black History Month. We have to set records straight, the historical record and the narrative, because it's crystal clear. The African heritage of folks, just in the two things I've shown you, I could do a whole slide deck on that alone, right, of the pictures that I took. But just the Maharpa thing, his mummy shows that he was Negroid, but not a Negro. And then looking at the headdress of the royalty, looking at the walls and seeing in stone the educational institutions that existed in Egypt. This is a student and a teacher in class engaging in the educational process. But people want to talk about gaps in educational attainment, divorcing Black people's contribution to education, divorcing people of African ancestry's contribution to the world. What do I mean when I say high culture? Africa is the home of the world's most ancient civilizations. Far too often, Africa has been thought of as isolated and static, but nothing could be further from the truth. The roots of every family tree trace here to Africa. And so does the history of civilization. In this series, we'll be going on a journey through 200,000 years of history. We'll explore great cities built along Africa's extensive trade networks, discover art of unparalleled beauty and technical brilliance, and marvel at thousands of years of breathtaking architecture. And so that's just a cursory glance of Africa. When we look at Africa in our domain, our field of education, we had universities in Africa in the 1300s that most people don't even know about. So when we talk about educational attainment and black people in education, we have to have an understanding of the University of San Corrie in Timbuktu. Another famous university that was established by Muslims but is rarely spoken about was the Sankora University that was founded in the masjid built by Mansa Musa in 1327 in West Africa. This university, which started off as an Islamic school or madrasa inside the masjid, went on to become one of the largest universities in the world at the time, hosting in its height 25,000 students and a library of 700,000 manuscripts, making it the largest library in Africa since the Library of Alexandria. The curriculum consisted not just of Islamic subjects, but science, mathematics, philosophy, astronomy, and even the occult sciences and medicine. Recent studies of these documents, for example, show a mathematics text that was used to teach the students who were studying in this university 600 years ago. And when this text was translated from Arabic into French and sent to Sorbonne University in Paris, they confirmed that the level of mathematics being taught 600 years ago at this university was equivalent to the second year of their mathematics degree program, which is one of the hardest to get into in France and in the Western world. Aside from this, literary criticisms of ancient Greek philosophy, detailed medical textbooks explaining how to conduct eye cataract removal operations, and thousands of verses of poetry translated and commented on, not just in Arabic, but in local West African languages using the tradition of Ajami script, which is writing West African languages with the Arabic script, were all found amongst the thousands and thousands of manuscripts here from this university. There was even a story of a scholar from the Hejaz who traveled to Mali in order to be able to teach in the university and was told he needed to take 10 years of prerequisite courses in the Karawin University in Morocco before he could be admitted into Sankore as a Black history matters. Black history matters because we are in the educational field and no one talks about the great universities of Africa in pre-colonial Africa. Black history matters because we have to talk about resistance, right? These narratives of that Black people were passively on the continent of Africa, just being able to be kidnapped and brought over here. Or in some cases, people blame Africans for their own enslavement and say, well, Black African kings were involved. Yes, they were involved. That The historical record shows that. But also, who was responsible once they got to the Western shores? Right? Were the African kings responsible for how we were treated when we got to the Western shores? Were all Africans complicit? No, because we know about Yasantiwa. 
We know Yasantiwa organized in the early 1900s and she fought against the British as they were trying to capture what would become the Gold Coast, but at the time was Ghana. We know about Queen Nzinga, Queen Nzinga, of the place of, on the continent of Africa that is now called Angola, from the Mbunti people who fought and fought the Portuguese for 40 years in resistance to the enslavement of her people. About Nat Turner, who led a rebellion in the United States of America and South Carolina. About David Walker, who you see a depiction of David Walker's appeal right here on this slide, who called for the liberation of people of what he called the colored citizens of the whole world. Harriet Ross Tubman, or Aramente Ross, who not only liberated herself, but went back into the South from the North to liberate up to 300 people. Not only did she serve in the Union Army, she was also a scout, a spy, and a nurse. Not only did she retire with a pension from the Union Army, but she started a senior citizen's home in Northern New York when she retired. People that are contemporaries like Bree Newsom, who took the matter into her own hands and said, we are not going to allow this rebel flag, this Confederate flag to continue to fly over South Carolina after the murders of nine parishioners in Charleston, South Carolina, and climbed up the flagpole and snatched it down. And Colin Kaepernick, the athlete who in a nonviolent protest to police killings of unarmed and in some cases innocent black people and put his entire career on the line. Resistance, the narrative of resistance has been missing. What else has been missing? Talking about the insurmountable odds. Black history matters because people do not connect the Haitian revolution with black people. But it was the only time in world history where people who were enslaved actually took over the nation state of their oppressor and eliminated the French from what was Santo Domingue, which became Haiti, which we call Haiti, with the organization of Toussaint Le Overture and Bookman and Kristoff, and literally lifted the yoke of oppression off of their necks. Black history matters because of the abolition of slavery. And a lot of people attributed to the stroke of a pen of Abraham Lincoln and Abraham Lincoln's presidency played a significant role in ending slavery. But you have to think about a time where black people were under the total domination of people who were classified as white in this country with no way out and for liberation to come because of the various insurrections and cooperation and eventually contributing to the Civil War. People don't know about Ottawa, but we talk about why do, why do we have to have black history? You don't even know about Ottawa, right? This picture that I'm showing you from a film that was made about it. Ottawa is about the battle where Italy came into Ethiopia and tried to colonize Ethiopia because technically Ethiopia is the only nation state on the continent of Africa that has never been formally colonized. And it's not because they haven't tried, but the Ethiopian army beat a contemporary Italian army and fended it off. And there's films about this, documentary and narrative. But people talk about why does black history matter, but we don't know about Ottawa. Insurmountable odds, George Washington Carver down in rural Tuskegee, Alabama, created on 300 inventions, right? Without all of the technological lab work and lab uh, equipment that his contemporaries had at uh, well-financed white universities. The civil rights movement, insurmountable odds. We don't tell the, the context of the civil rights movement where the total state apparatus had absolute control over the movement of black life and that people organized themselves to destroy that system of apartheid America. The insurmountable odds, the odds to think that a man that has a Kenyan father, a white mother from Kansas can grow up in Hawaii and become the 44th president of the United States of America in one generation past the Black Power Movement. The context is important. It's not that we just raise up the icons. It's what was the context? You know, we talk about civil rights, but why did we have to have civil rights? We had to have civil rights because we had an apartheid state. Context is everything. Policies. Black people have been able to achieve, achieve things even though we came up in a system that had literacy laws. What is a literacy law? If you taught a black person how to read, 
you will be fined and the black person will be killed. So we're looking at our equity data. We're looking at our achievement data from the context as if black people always had access to the best education. When there's laws on books saying that the death penalty is what we would get if we were found to know how to read. When they created the Fugitive Slave Act, what is the Fugitive Slave Act? If you escape what was uh, typically called the North, I mean the South, which was below the Mason-Dixon line, it made it so-called North. So if you went from Kentucky to Ohio, you were technically free. But they changed the law saying that we can go into the North and get you and turn you into a slave. And that's why you have the movie 12 Years a Slave, a man who was not enslaved, who was considered to be enslaved and, and captured because of acts like the Fugitive Slave Law. Black people, one, not having the electoral franchise, even though it was promised by the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment of the Constitution of the United States of America, but they have to wait a whole nother hundred years and still having voter suppression and still being able to be elected and to help people get elected. Redlining, which created the modern wealth gap that we have and the housing crisis that we have. Black people not allowed to buy homes in areas that gain value. The insurance companies, one of the most famous stories about insurance uh, companies not upholding uh, their standards to a family is Malcolm X when his father was found split in half by a train car. They told his mother, a mother of seven, it was suicide and we can't pay out the insurance. This happened to black people throughout the time. Ain't nothing they could do about it. Entire laws structured around lies around black people. Look up the Harrison Narcotic Act. The Harrison Narcotic Act was passed because it was a myth created that said, quote unquote, cocaine crazed Negroes were raping white women on the docks. And so that's why you have cocaine uh, as considered a narcotic and an illegal drug because of cocaine crazed Negroes were rap raping white women. And they said that because they were on cocaine, the regular 32 caliber bullet wouldn't stop a cocaine crazed Negro. So we have to up the calibers of our guns on the police force for these black men who are out of control. And then Rockefeller laws. Those who don't know the Rockefeller laws, a person who's caught with a certain amount of rock cocaine versus the amount of powder cocaine. If you have the exact same amount of cocaine, but it's powder, you get less time than a person who has rock cocaine. Insurmountable odds. We have to talk about the global impact of culture. How Martin Luther King is not just a figure who helped to do something for black people in America or America, but throughout the globe. The Black Panthers influence, influencing places like India where they created something called the Dolly Panthers for the people who were considered the untouchables in the cast and they begin to organize themselves inspired by the Black Panther Party for self-defense. Literature, as you see, a translation of a Toni Morrison book, right, The Bluest Eye. In, in various languages. And you look at how vast and broad black literature has uh, changed the world. Hip hop, every corner of the world has been influenced by hip hop, something that was created by black and Puerto Rican youth in New York City and athletics and how black people uh, and athletes are influencing everywhere and especially in contemporary times in China. And of course, we are part of the diaspora. We have to stop disconnecting black American life from blacks in Africa. Blacks in Brazil and Blacks through the greater Caribbean. So what do I mean by these lessons learned? I'm gonna conclude by talking about some of these lessons learned. And why am I going to talk about these lessons learned? Well, the first lesson learned is from reconstruction. This is a part of history when people talk about why does black history matter that doesn't get a lot of conversation. That doesn't get a lot of engagement, right? It lasted roughly from 1863 to 1877. And it was basically the end of the Civil War where places in the South that had majority black populations because the majority of their population were enslaved Africans, places like South Carolina and Louisiana and Georgia and Mississippi, once slavery was over with and once the Union troops settled into the Confederate South and began to enforce the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, Black people became what? Elected officials. These are, quote unquote, the first colored senator and House of Representatives, the 41st and 42nd Congress in the United States of America. We already had Black senators and Black House of Representatives members and Black governors, right? Black governors meaning PBS Pinchback in Louisiana. And when they 
uh, enacted what we call the Compromise of 1877. Pay attention to this. In 1876, the 1876 election was the most divisive in US history. And here's how Congress responded. And basically, this is what happened. A backroom deal and a momentous political compromise to settle the election during a series of secretive meetings Southern Democratic lawmakers promised to call off the filibuster and concede their election in exchange for an end to reconstruction. Though the terms of the informal agreement remain unknown, it is thought to have included the withdrawal of all federal forces from the former Confederacy, increased federal funds for Southern states, the construction of a transcontinental railroad for the South, and the appointment of a Southern Democrat in Hayes to Hayes's cabinet. In the wee hours of March 2nd, 1877, a mere three days before the scheduled inauguration, Congress completed the electoral vote count. Hayes won by a single electoral vote amid fear of assassination. He was sworn in during a secret ceremony the next day. Learning the lessons. Right now we are in a political crisis where there was an attempt to end the democratic process and end the voting, the counting of the electoral votes. And now people are saying, we need to forget about that. We just need to unify. Well, the last time we did that in 1876, just say, forget about it and unify. It left black people vulnerable. It said in a hundred years, 100 years of Jim Crow that didn't end until 1964 with the signing of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. So we have to learn the lessons to be aware of these calls for unity without accountability and unity without justice. Because Toni Morrison teaches us, freeing yourself was one thing, but claiming ownership of that freedom was another thing. What do we mean by that? We have to learn the lessons from the Black Freedom Movement. Yes, people fought hard to end de jure segregation, as you can see here from this incredible iconic uh, photograph that was depicting uh, Southern life in the United States of America. And the Civil Rights Movement also produced uh, a sense of Black pride. But Black pride in ending de jure segregation means very little unless we have an institutional analysis about what we're really talking about. Are we really talking about people just being nice to us? Are we really talking about people just being civil? Are we really talking about a transformation of institutions as James Baldwin cautioned us about? I don't know what most white people in this country feel. I can only include what they feel from the state of their institutions. I don't know if white Christians hate Negroes or not, but I know that we have a Christian church which is white and a Christian church which is, which is black. I know as Malcolm X once put it, the most segregated hour in American life is high noon on Sunday. That says a great deal for me about a Christian nation. It means that I can't afford to trust most white Christians and certainly cannot trust the Christian church. I don't know whether the labor unions and their bosses really hate me. That doesn't matter, but I know I'm not in their unions. I don't know if the real estate lobby is anything Ooh, against black over. people, but I know the real estate lobbies keep me in the ghetto. I don't know if the, if the Board of Education hates black people, but I know the textbooks that give my children to read and the schools that we have to go to. Now, this is the evidence. You want me to make an act of faith, risking myself, my wife, my woman, my sister, my children, on some idealism which you assure me exists in America, which I have never I seen. And so what do we learn from Jimmy Baldwin? Now, if we don't learn these institutional lessons, we end up here after the civil rights movement. As this article clearly demonstrates, it says that was not a typo. The median net worth of black Bostonians is really eight for eight dollars because we were focused on getting rid of the signs and getting rid of those barriers. But we weren't talking about all of the extraction that was taking place while black people were marginalized that allowed wealth to be aggregated and totally removed from our communities. And right now, estimates by eco economists says this, if the racial wealth divide is left unaddressed, median black household wealth is on a path to hit zero by 2053. This is why black history matters because we have to learn these lessons. And these aren't new lessons. Martin Luther King Jr. told us this in the 1960s. At the very same time that America refused to give the Negro any land, through an act of Congress, our government was giving away millions of acres of land in the West and the Midwest. 
which meant that it was willing to undergird its white peasants from Europe with an economic floor. But not only did they give the land, they built land-grant colleges with government money to teach them how to farm. Not only that, they provided county agents to further their expertise in farming. Not only that, they provided low interest rates in order that they could mechanize our farms. Not only that, today, many of these people are receiving millions of dollars in federal subsidies not to farm, and they are the very people telling the black man that he ought to lift himself by his own bootstraps. And this is what we are faced with, and this is a reality. Now, when we come to Washington in this campaign, we are coming to get our check. We're coming to get our check because Dr. King knew that the social barriers being removed was not going to be enough to put Black people in a position to truly exercise our citizenship fully. What is another lesson we need to learn? The hip hop lesson. What is the hip hop lesson that we learn from history? We learn something called the transformation of subjects and objects. What do we mean by that? Young Black people and Puerto Rican people took cardboard which were used to package things and turn it into dance floors. We took turntables, which were used to play records and turn them into instruments. We took subway trains that were meant to transport people and turn them into moving murals. And so we're in a process now that we have to learn the lesson that we have to be able to repurpose and realign ourselves to what we have access to so that we can create a new reality and take that lesson from hip hop of transformation of subjects and objects, right? Because Alice Walker told us that the most common way people give up their power is by thinking they don't have any. And so one of the most important lessons that we can learn from the founders of the Black Lives Matter movement, Alicia, Opal, and Patrice, is that it is imperative that they that we access what we have access to, that we leverage what we have access to. They took Twitter, they took social media and leveraged it differently. You have black people in Georgia who are taking the lessons from hip hop and saying, okay, we can buy land, we have access to land. We constantly are being harassed in our communities. What we're gonna do is we're gonna pool our resources and we're gonna create communities where we are safe, right? A safe haven. And then you see our students on our campuses in this post George Floyd moment, creating collectives throughout the United States of America, saying that we have demands of our institutions to no longer give lip service to the equity imperatives, to the diversity imperatives, to the inclusive, inclusion imperatives. But what we wanna see is actual action and we're gonna organize and we're gonna hold you accountable. And so, as we reflect on Black History Month and why it matters, it's important that those of us in the academy not only be inclusive just because I'm recommending it to you, but you actually see the value of looking at Blacks in law, in literature, in communications, in medicine, in entrepreneurship, in science, in math, in politics, and even entertainment, in all of those different areas. And look within the curriculum and say, why is it absent when we know that we've had contributions from time immemorial, right? That's what made the movie and the book Hidden Figures so powerful. These women hidden in plain sight, mathematicians and scientists, right? And even historians didn't even know their contributions and they're there everywhere. And so I want you to understand that what I'm talking about in terms of black history mattering in terms of Black lives mattering, is what author Alfonso Schomburg, the founder of the Schomburg Center in Harlem, New York, stated. African history is simply the missing pages of world history. And so our responsibility and our opportunity is to seek out, to curate, and to weave in these missing pages so that as communities, regardless of our cultural backgrounds, regardless of our identities, 
can now disrupt the narratives that have been told and created to dehumanize black people and that black people, we can actually leverage and be able to find our power and use it for the greater good of our communities. Black history matters. Thank you very much. Wow, that was powerful. So incredible, Lasana. And you know, what I'm thinking now is it's the absence of all of that wealth of information that you provided us in one hour, right? That we've not had many of us in our lifetime. And, um, you know, you're making me think about when people talk about whiteness or white supremacy, it's, it's you know, this kind of um, active erasure of, of all of the wealth of information that you just shared. And I know, for example, uh, one of my mentors was Mr. Sal Castro, and he led 20,000 Chicano, Chicana, Chicanx students and walking out demanding better conditions in, in our schools. And he said, you know, you have to fight the cucuy. In Spanish, the cucuy is like the monster, right? And he's like, the cucuy will come and they'll try and snatch your name and your, your history and make you forget how amazing you are. And so you're making me think that, right? That there's been like an active agenda. And what you're calling us to is to recognize black history matters and we need to actively seek it out. And so just thank you for sharing your knowledge and wisdom with us in such a profound way. And, and I know I have questions that were already coming in to me. So um, what I'm gonna do everyone is um, I'm gonna field the questions. So I have one question that I'm gonna start with and then I do see a couple of hands raised, so I'll go there. Um, but I'm asking this question on behalf of Armia Walker, who is our faculty coordinator for Black Academia. What can we do at our campus today to help remedy the erasure of the Black influence and contributions in higher education to help validate the lived experiences of our Black students? Thank you very much for the question and thank you for the, uh, the response to the presentation. Um, so today, I kind of uh, concluded with that, right? Is that wherever you are, wherever your locus of control, whatever your, your discipline in your area, uh, you can go and find out uh, how can you be intentional and deliberate about uh, gaining your, enhancing your awareness and also your uh, own personal insights so that you can be able to deliver it to the students. But it's about um, not just sharing content or information. Uh, uh, the educational process, uh, the teaching and learning, whether it's uh, pedagogy or andragogy, is not the mere imparting of information. It's worldview, it's worldview. And so that's why what I was saying was that, like for instance, the vast majority of people who are on this call know about Martin Luther King Jr., but they don't know Martin Luther King Jr. did that quote that I showed. You understand what I'm saying? So what I'm saying is that I could have showed I have a dream clip and still included Martin Luther King Jr. in this talk, but I decided to include the Martin Luther King Jr. when he was talking about economic justice. And so that's why I was saying that the way in which we are inclusive, we have to talk about it from a perspective of overcoming insurmountable odds, our, com our contributions to high culture, where resistance is, like what is the context of it? And you can find that in every single field of endeavor. So I encourage everyone to find where black life, black individuals, black communities, black organizations have contributed to wherever you are within the institution and then seek out that particular uh, uh, worldview that centers agency. So I'll give a quick example and then we'll go to another question because we don't have a lot of time. Um, I was at a school uh, in Iowa giving a talk in a classroom and uh, a young lady, a young white sister raised her hand and she was like, um, I hear that um, Afrocentrism is when uh, you come up with these uh, these these black 
stories so that black students can feel good about themselves. And I was like, that's not what Afrocentricity is at all, right? And I don't know what they're teaching you here. I said, but let me give you an example. I said, I'm not gonna even go to Imhotep to ancient Egypt. I said, I'll just use baseball, okay? Normally, when we talk about black people in baseball, we start with the great Jackie Robinson. And I understand why we do that because of his entree into major league baseball. I said, but that is Eurocentric because it's where uh, the major league baseball has all the power has all the agency and they're letting a black person into their thing. I said, but if you wanna talk about baseball from an African center perspective, you would talk about Rube Foster. And Rube Foster was a commissioner of the Negro Leagues. And in the Negro Leagues, you had black owners, black managers and black players. And when Rube Foster was developing the Negro Leagues and he thought about integration with major league baseball, he wasn't thinking about taking the best players and putting them individually. He was seeing whole franchises that the homestead Grays as a franchise will be owned and operated by black people and the whole franchise would join major league baseball, right? That's what their integration was, but we still had agency. And so again, not only talking about narrative, not only including people, but where did the people have power? Because we cannot keep being told as we're on the periphery or on the outside of other communities. That's why I was very much saying, look, we can't just keep talking about black first out of context. Black first exists because of apartheid state. And if we keep ignoring context, the more we ignore context, the more we normalize the terrorism that people of color have experienced for eons in this nation. We act like it's just normal to just lynch people. And so you had to have an Ida B. Wells. No, that was very abnormal. We have to talk about the abnormality of it to put Ida B. Wells in context. So I love Ida B. Wells, like deeply, right? She was a woman who stood up for black people at a time where black men wouldn't even talking about lynching. However, we have to talk about the whole lynching process to appreciate Ida B. Wells. And so I say all that to say, start where you are, understand worldview, and understand agency. Awesome, Rube Foster, let's hear it for him. Okay, thank you, Lasana. Um, I do have uh, Dr. Gina Lopez with a question and then I'll go to the chat. I know there's a question there too. Dr. Lopez. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Olivo, and thank you for bringing Brother Lasana here. I appreciate your talk. Um, I was very loud, so I had to make sure I turned my uh, <laughs> my mic down because I was with you rather. So my question is in regards to the bird in the coal mine analogy, why do you think that uh, this phenomenon still exists? And how do you suggest we bridge the gap between our communities when this phenomenon is at play? Are uh, you talking about the canary in the coal mine? The canary in uh, the coal mine, thank you. Yeah. yeah, so that, I actually borrowed that analogy for this from Dr. Pedro Nogueira. And the reason why I brought that and used that in some of my work, uh, and also my colleague Jeremiah Sims, we use it in our work, is because Dr. Pedro Nogueira makes this argument. He's saying that Black people have been so marginalized and so exploited, not, not, you know, not just you know, some comparative analysis. We're not trying to talk about oppression Olympics. But what we're saying is that, you know, just relatively, that if we are able to solve the issues and create justice for those communities by the lessons we learn from addressing the challenges in those communities will be able to be applied to other communities. But if we continue to, as Amakal Cabral, he says, Amakal Cabral told us, mass no difficulties, tell no lies, claim no easy victories. A lot of times in this work around race, we like to claim easy victories. We like to seek out what is the, the, the easiest thing that we can do to appear that we are addressing race, right? We don't say what is the most challenging and pressing and thing that's needed and then addressing that. And by addressing that, you might actually be able to address all that's with it. So the canary in the coal mine is really about if we are really able to address this long protracted historical relationship of the African and the United States of America along the economic, social, educational, uh, legal and all the other lines, and we work with those communities, we'll be able to apply those lessons that we learn from those communities for other communities. Yeah, you know, um, Lasana, you're also making me think as I reflect even on your presentation, what you're also sharing with us is that Black culture and Black history, Black contributions spans 
all of the disciplines. So it's like, yes, we can take a black history class, but black history can be infused across everything from mathematics to economics to business and all of all of the disciplines really. So thank you um, so much. And, and with that, I do have a question about, do you have a published reading list that you would recommend to people who want to increase their knowledge? Uh, that's That question has come up in the chat. Okay, so no, I don't have a published reading list for this particular phenomenon, but what I will do is get one to Dr. Olivo and then she can share it. But I'll tell you uh, a couple of books to just start out, right? A, a very good comprehensive uh, text on black history in the United States of America. It's called Before the Mayflower and it's by Dr. Lerone Bennett. And Before the Mayflower is a very concise narrative history uh, that I would consider uh, uh, one of the premier uh, accurate uh, texts. Um, another book that I would recommend is a biographical book, but the way in which the biography is written, it addresses a lot of historical context. And that is um, uh, the autobiography of Malcolm X. Another book that I recommend as a historical book that really contextualizes uh, the his history of people of African ancestry within the context of racialized ideas is Ibram Kendi's Stamped from the Beginning. So between Stamped from the Beginning, the Autobiography of Malcolm X, and Lerone Bennett's the, uh, Before the Mayflower, those three texts will be able to lay a foundation. So just to kind of give you an idea of how this works, um, my uh, undergraduate work, I double majored in speech communications and history, and my graduate work is in history. So that's why I have such a historical rootedness. However, um, what happened was when I went to college, we didn't have a black studies program or ethnic studies program. And we only had two African-American history classes and they both were taught by uh, brilliant white women. Dr. Curtin was one of my most influential uh, instructors there. She's a white woman who taught African-American history, but we didn't have that. So what we did is we started an organization that we taught each other on Wednesdays. And let me just tell you this right now, we would go to the E 185 section of the library. If you go to the E-185 section of the library, that's all the books on Black people. And we would just go and kind of peruse and we'll look and we'll say, hmm, that's interesting. And then we'd be like, what are you teaching on Wednesday? And then we'll grab a book and I'll be like, I guess I'll be teaching the philosophies and opinions of Marcus Garvey. <laughs> and we would study the philosophies and opinions of Marcus Garvey. And then that Wednesday I would teach it. And then someone else would go to the E-185 section of the library and they'll look for some books and they'll be like, oh, okay. Uh, Jawanza Kunjufu, Black Economics. I guess I'll be teaching on Black Economics. And this is literally how we begin. We just begin to mine resources, right? But what I found is that from Lerone Bennett's book, Ibram Kenny's book, and Autobiography of Malcolm X, those are good foundational texts to prepare anyone to be able to understand not only the information, but worldview. Worldview is very important. Thank you. And I do see a suggestion in the chat about, um, you know, having a book club and reading um, Stamp from the Beginning or some of these recommendations that Lasana has so that we're doing it in community. And just like Lasana said, he'd walk over to the library with a group and pull some information out and then, you know, be in community and try something. So, yes, we'll continue to um, you know, do those efforts of communal book clubs. Um, let's see, any qu other questions um, that I see coming up? I know one of our students, Emmanuel, points out that at one point, you know, Jackie Robinson couldn't stand and sing the national anthem. This was in 1972, but public education, K-12, and even some higher ed doesn't include that information in education. So people are unaware, right? The, the narrative is that um, Jackie Robinson was able to enter the MLB and then, you know, that was changing the course of history and creating inclusion, but he did face a lot of discrimination even after that point. So um, the there is another, oh, yes, Lasana. I think the narrative is always there, the happily ever after. And that's yes. why we have to interpret. We have to interrogate narratives and reconcile the history 
Yeah, so we do have another question. Um, how do we have um, unity without accountability? What can we do to highlight this nonsense and, and fight it? Tito, am I asking your question? Well, no, um, hello, uh, again, you did mention it earlier on and I keep hearing it, how they want us to have unity without accountability. And for me, it was really, how can we highlight this nonsense and how can we actually do something against it when that's what's just being propagated uh, on us or handled like, no, we need to move forward. We need to move forward. Like we haven't even addressed the actual issues still. Uh, yet you still want us to already move forward without, as you are mentioning, the accountability with everything that you've just described. Like really, how can we, how can we move forward by while holding folks accountable who don't want it? Yeah, absolutely. So, so yeah, Tito, I, I, I think you asked a question so that we can put it in the conversation piece. I think you pretty much know what's going on. Uh, this is just by <laughs> the way you're asking the question, but I'll, I'll, I'll give it to you like this, um, is the reason why I show reconstruction in this particular talk, like I could have showed all kinds of stuff about our history, is because of this particular moment where we saw an assault on the capital, the physical apparatus, but also on democracy, the idea and the ideals of the United States of America. And the benefactors of that um, uh, uh, riot insurrection are saying, it's no big deal, um, you know, let's move on for the sake of unity. And the reason why I talked about reconstruction, because what I'm trying to tell you is that History doesn't necessarily repeat itself, but it does rhyme. And if we don't learn the lesson, right? If we don't learn the lesson that, uh, if we don't, because what happened is when they said, okay, in 1876, and, and they had a, content, a, a contentious um, uh, election, and the only reason it was a contentious election is because the Southerners didn't want, they sent two different delegates, like they tried to do uh, this past election. They tried to send two set of delegates to make it controversial. It wasn't controversial. It was clear that Rutherford B. Hayes had won, but they made it controversial and put them in a situation to make them happy to get the troops out of the South because it was threatening the quote unquote way of life. And that's the same type of arguments that you hear being made in contemporary times is that if you put this party in power, they're gonna change your way of life. They're gonna let all of these people in here that's gonna rob and rape your daughters. They're gonna let all these people in here just lay up off of welfare and free medical care, right? It's this whole no narrative of fear about a way of life being threatened. And I did a talk yesterday for uh, an institution and uh, we had a little break, uh, you know, cause it was very like a three hour training. And we had a break and one of the persons, you know, got off mute during the break. And normally when I go on break, I just try to step away from the computer, but I happen to be at the computer. And he was like, how do you have this conversation, Lasana, without people feeling like they're attacked? I said, well, what do you mean by feeling like they're attacked? Cause it was a conversation about equity in the workplace. And he said, because people feeling like, you know, uh, we're taking their jobs and giving their jobs to blacks and Latin people. I said, that's the, I said, therein lies the challenge. I said, listen to what you said, taking their jobs. Who said that the job belongs to an individual racial group? Why is it already the assumption that these are quote unquote white jobs, that there's white jobs, there's black jobs, there's Latin jobs, there's Asian jobs, there's gay jobs, there's straight jobs, right? Who, who makes this assumption that it's this kind of job and the job is being quote unquote taken away? And so in summary, if those who haven't seen Judas and the Black Messiah, um, the film that just came out by the Lucas Brothers and Shaka King, one of the things that Fred Hampton talks about consistently in the Black Panther Party, he already talked about was raising the contradictions, heightening the contradiction. And the way that we do that, Tito, in this moment of unity is we constantly heighten the contradiction. We constantly point out not only the hypocrisies, but how it's contradictory and how it ultimately doesn't lead to what people say it leads to, right? You're not gonna have unity without accountability because we've never been able to have unity without accountability. It's historically unprecedented and it's a virtual impossibility. Thank you so much, Lasana. And I just wanna uh, let everybody know that our associated students, the Office of Student Life, the Cross-Cultural Center, um, Student Activities, they're working on a series regarding the insurrection and they have requested 
that we bring Lasana back to launch that. And so um, those of you who are just as taken in as you know we all are here today, um, please let everyone know Lasana will be back. And uh, we're just so thankful to you, Lasana, for being here with us today. Um, that was powerful, um, so moving, and uh, we all learned a lot from you today. Thank you. And I just also want to thank everyone for spending your college hour with us today and to remind you that we have a lot of events remaining in Black History Month. So um, <clears throat> just to mention a few, we have our game night, our hip hop forum, our Black 365 Knowledge Bowl. We have our Show Your Grit in a sit down conversation with Michael Vick. Our Black Student Success Center virtual open house, our grand opening of our expanded center for Black students. And then we also have our talent showcase, our open mic night, and our educational pipeline event. So there's a lot for you to participate in. I hope to see you there. And thank you so much, Lasana. Bye-bye. Okay, um, everybody's getting off. Thank you, Dr. Ali.